Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the editor in chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Rambus fellow Steve Wu, who's going to talk today about the trade-offs between HBM2 and GDDR6. Steve, as an engineer building a system, we, we've seen that HBM2 typically goes into the higher end devices. GDDR6 goes into the more cost sensitive ones. What's the trade-off? What are you really looking at? Is it all about price or is it something else? Well, there's engineering complexity as well, and so HBM2 is newer, and it requires a kind of a broader range of engineering skills in order to implement. If you can do it, it can provide some advantages, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, if that's not really the, uh, your cup of tea or the kind of thing that you're experienced with, then you might go the GDDR6 route, which relies on more established, kind of older uh, design experience that many people have. Is there going to be a uh, big difference in terms of the applications on which one is used where? You know, we're starting to see a blurring now where um, people that use HBM, of course, are typically using it for the highest performance tasks, but people are also using GDDR6 for very high performance tasks, and they're really adapting to use whichever memory uh, is the best for their application, and it's really a set of trade-offs. Why don't you draw this out for us? I'd be happy to. So what are we looking at here? So I'm going to show you the difference between how you'd implement a GDDR6 memory system and an HBM2 memory system. In a real world example, I'm going to show you for a 256 gigabyte per second memory system, something that you would typically see in, in use today. And so on the left here, I'm going to start by showing you how you'd implement this with GDDR6. And the way you would do this is you would have four DRAMs connected to a processor. So this is going to be my GPU, and this will be one of my DRAMs. And so the way this works is um, you have a standard PCB, which is shown here, and you just connect the GPU to the DRAM uh, through just standard connections that go right into the PCB. This again is a very common um, connection uh, kind of uh, topology, and again, very some, something that's very commonly done in the industry, so it relies on a lot of historical experience. Is it the same whether you're using a PCB or whether you're using a, uh, for example, RDL in a package or uh, potentially multiple multi-die uh, type packaging? Well, the idea behind how you would connect a processor to the memory is similar. It could be, um, it's a similar idea uh, as if you use an interposer, and that's a great uh, way to kind of transition over to what does it look like in HBM2. And so in HBM2, it's a little bit different. The DRAMs are newer, and what they do is they have a stack of DRAM die, which is shown right here, all packaged together. And that, uh, that stack of DRAM die is then connected to your processor, which is shown over here. Now, what's really interesting about it is, instead of having kind of a small number of connections like you do in GDDR6, HBM2 requires a much larger number of connections. We're talking on the order of 1,000. And those thousand connections, you actually can't use a standard PCB because it's not designed to have that many connections. Instead, what you have is something called an interposer. And today, these are typically made out of silicon. And, and what you can do with silicon interposers is you can make very small wires that are fine pitch, and you can put many of them together. Uh, and so it allows you to take the many IOs that you need to connect your HBM uh, device stack to your processor and do it all in one uh, interposer. The problem is you eventually have to get that in interposer assembly onto a standard PCB because that's how we make electronics. And so what you need in between that is a substrate. And the substrate acts a bit like a gasket that allows you to take that silicon interposer assembly and put it directly onto a PCB. So more complicated structure, more layers and things that you need to get right in order to get this thing completely assembled. It does take more skill, it's newer, and it, uh, it does require um, some additional steps and some additional cost as well. And HBM2 is also being used in some of the advanced fan outs now too, right? Yeah, so um, it's, uh, it's being used actually across a range of things. You see it used in things like supercomputing, it's used in AI, uh, and it's used in very high-end graphics type systems. Okay, so as you're designing these and you're, you're in the architecture phase, you're now going to choose between Am I going GDDR6 or HBM2? What's your trade-off there? What's your, your bottom line for what you're trying to achieve? Yeah, so um, a lot of it is really what the goals of your product are. Um, if the goals are to have a high-performance system, you'd have to integrate all this thinking into how you produce the entire system. Uh, there are, again, these complexities with how you engineer the system here, so you have to manage thermals a little bit differently in an HBM system compared to a GDDR6 system. And so that all goes into that whole system design thinking. 
what I would say is, um, as engineers, we've transitioned our thinking more to the system level now to take into account all these factors. And it used to be, I've got the fastest processor, I'm going to change the, uh, the frequency of the processor, therefore my whole system will run faster, and I'm going to just add more memory. This is a whole different way of looking at it, right? It is, and the primary thing that's different here is you start to think about power efficiency as well, in, especially in data centers. Power efficiency um, factors into that cost of ownership. And so it really depends on the type of job you're trying to do and how important uh, the, the power efficiency is in your equation for overall cost and ownership. Any impact in terms of noise, uh, reliability of the signals? Yeah, um, obviously when you have uh, something like HBM2, you have uh, a lot more interconnections and they're running at a slower speed. So it is easier to maintain signal integrity from that standpoint. But the trade-off is the complexity in building this type of system and making it reliable. You have more components that you have to put together. They're under different kinds of stresses as the system operates. And so system level reliability can be very different than what you would see in a more traditional system like GDDR6. Are you seeing different uses in different markets for these? So uh, is HBM2 ever, for example, going to make it into automotive or is it still going to be confined to the data center? Yeah. Um, it really depends. I think it's a, uh, it's a great lead-in application right now in the data center. The, the environment tends to be better controlled. I think as the industry becomes much more experienced and as uh, it becomes more popular and as manufacturing becomes better for these types of devices, it should open up other avenues and other markets. I think uh, some markets today, like consumer and things like that, uh, really main, are, are really kind of outside the range of HBM today, could be partly because they don't need that kind of performance and partly because of the complexity of putting the system together. There's an HBM2E coming and an HBM3 coming. Is there a comparable uh, one for GDDR6? Yeah, I think um, historically uh, the industry has looked to develop new graphics standards every few years. And so GDDR6 is coming to market now and um, I think you know, people in the industry are going to look at what's next uh, pretty soon. So HBM2E is just faster, or is there any difference other than that? Uh, yeah, so HBM2E, really the primary difference is that it's faster. Uh, and so um, now that HBM devices are in the market and people are becoming very successful with deploying them, there's really this insatiable need for more bandwidth and for better power efficiency. And so uh, standards like HBM3, and I'm sure there'll be standards beyond that, they'll look to make uh, kind of the smallest changes that are necessary in order to continue providing much higher performance and power efficiency. Is what we're doing here really just increasing the density of the memory and adding more chips and faster throughput, uh, or is it something beyond that? Yeah, there's a complex interplay between uh, the capacity of these stacks, so you're going to eventually want to put more devices into the stack, and you're going to have to balance that with how many IOs you can actually run through an interposer. So there's these, uh, there's a, a number of complex trade-offs, how expensive you want the interposer to be, and that will influence how many wires you have, and then how many devices you want in the stack, and how, what the bandwidth needs to be in order to really feed the processor with all that data. And a lot of these devices, one of the big complaints we hear is they're I.O. limited, right? So which one works best for what? Well, yeah, so for something like HBM, uh, what we've seen is that uh, that works by far the best for systems that are the most power constrained at, and that need the highest levels of bandwidth, but which are also willing to pay the cost and complexity to get there. Now, it can be prohibitive to do this kind of system, and so I think if the cost were equal and engineering difficulty were equal to GDDR6, you'd see lots of people going in this direction. But because they're not equal, uh, there is a, a large fraction of the market that will stay with something like GDDR6 simply because um, it's easier to, to engineer with. Steve, let's sort of down into some of the numbers that people are trading off here. Yeah, so um, now I'm going to show you from an actual implementation standpoint how these two systems would differ. Again, we're going for a 256 gigabyte per second implementation. And for GDDR6, you would take four DRAMs, which are shown here, and you'd connect them to a processor. And there's some critical circuits on that processor which actually talk to the DRAMs called the phi. And uh, there's, a, there's a big difference between kind of the phi area and power that you need to dedicate on that processor. Uh, on the right here, we see HBM2, and so you can actually do that bandwidth with just a single DRAM stack. And what you do is connect it onto the processor uh, through, again, a series of circuits called a PHY, 
and you mount that whole thing on your interposer. And so let me show you kind of the trade-offs. So in the case of GDDR6, each DRAM uh, it has a small number of pins, and they're running at a high data rate. In this particular case, they're running at 16 gigabits per second. In the case of HBM2, you have many more interconnects. You have over 1,000. And so you can actually get the same bandwidth by running each of those IOs at a much lower data rate. In this particular case, it's just two gigabits per second. Uh, and so in terms of the phi area, is how much area of, on that processor silicon you need to dedicate to real estate in order to talk to those DRAMs? What we find is that uh, GDDR6 takes anywhere between one and a half to 1.75 times more area than it does for HBM2. And in the case of power, uh, we actually um, see a, a much bigger difference here. So in this case, for GDDR6, it's anywhere from 3.5 to 4.5 times the power uh, on that phi uh, compared to uh, HBM2. But where you start to get an advantage with GDDR6 is the fact that the interposer, you don't actually have one in GDDR6, so there's none here. But in the case of HBM2, this can cost you tens of dollars. It's not unusual to see that thing be more than $20. And so it's an additional cost, uh, and you have to make sure your system can bear that cost. And that's an improvement over what it used to be. They used to, when they first were introduced, most of those were running about $100, right? Well, we've heard numbers that are very, very high. And so, yeah, I mean, certainly as the technologies become more broadly deployed, the costs are coming down. But yeah, many people are very surprised, not only in the cost of that interposer, but the additional cost with engineering that into a system and the additional manufacturing steps. And then the last thing is really the memory itself. So this is a more traditional kind of memory, GDDR6. It's much more like DDR um, and uh, LPDDR. So it's very much like those. Uh, and in the case of HPM2, it's very different. It's stacked. And so stacking actually adds cost and complexity and can reduce the yield as well. And so, again, there's additional costs here, and you just have to make sure your system can actually bear uh, the additional costs and the additional complexity that are associated with HBM2. Would you expect to see um, HBM2 in an edge device, uh, or would you expect to see GDR6 in something like that? Yeah, I actually expect to see both uh, in edge devices. And really what we're starting to see now as people talk more about the edge is um, the edge itself, the definition is starting to uh, really bifurcate or split into more parts. There's the near edge and the far edge. And so, you know, um, as you uh, get closer to the data center, I would expect some of those solutions to look more data center-like. So you may see HBM2 and GDDR6. As you get further out towards the endpoints, it'll start to look more like the endpoints. It could even be things like LPDDR. And one of the problems with Moore's Law is as, as it slows, it becomes harder to get to uh, the next node and still uh, get the power performance benefits that you were seeing in the past. So Samsung has, has rolled out numbers that are somewhere in the range of 20%. HBM2 is another way of saying, oh, we can do more than that, right? We can improve the throughput, we can push the, the boundaries of where you can get to with just normal scaling. That's right. So it, um, it does change the equation is one way to kind of think about it. So now, as an architect, you get to think about things differently. If you can engineer your system in a way to take advantage of it, suddenly you have more power in your budget and more bandwidth than you might have with other solutions. Steve Wu, thanks for a great explanation. Oh, you're very welcome.